I don't know how many of you have experienced that moment coming out of a baptismal, having just been a completely submerged in water, but I've got to tell you, it, it's quite an experience. I remember feeling very, very wet. And as I sopped out of the uh, baptismal, I remember thinking to myself, I hope my leather belt doesn't shrink. It, uh, it didn't. Uh, but uh, it's those random thoughts that come through your mind. Uh, this happened when I was in college uh, as a sophomore. I had decided uh, I'm going to follow Jesus. And so I told my pastor this. He said that the right response to this is baptism. And so I uh, got wet that following Sunday. It was an impressive, impressively physical experience. You don't go out to lunch after being completely submerged in water. You're uh, still a little... <laughs> you got to get the water out of your shoes. Uh, I think it is important and essential that choosing to follow Jesus begins with such an obvious physical act. Whether it is immersion as an adult or whether it is dousing a child's head with water, that, that gets their attention quite a bit too. Uh, I don't know how many children you've been up close to watch bapt bat be baptized, but uh, if they aren't screaming, what they're usually doing is looking at you. And, and they're, they're looking at you and, and though they can't say it, they're asking, why are you doing this? And by the time the water hits their head for the third time, whew, yeah. You have their attention. Uh, and so if you've ever wondered what, what is the right amount of water to use for baptism, the correct amount is as much as possible. Uh, and that's why I, I put towels down when we do a baptism here because I, I don't want to get everything else wet. But you use as much water as you can get away with because it, it, it's, it's part of the decision to turn, to follow Jesus as Lord, to follow him towards uh, salvation. It's not a, just a mental decision, it's a physical decision, and, and if, as you do that, you just don't think about it, you get wet and you do it. Baptism in all of its cold awkwardness it is a, a reminder and an affirmation that uh, to follow Jesus is not mental and spiritual, it's also very bodily as well. And, and I, we, we're reminded of this... Um, and it's good to be reminded of this because it is tempting to sort of over-spiritualize following Jesus. Think about how, you know, it's just something we think about. Um, this creeps into aspects of our faith. For example, we think about uh, sin. If you think about sin, it, it's something you've done against God. And if you just uh, bow your heads and pray, you'll be forgiven and that's fine. But, but no, wait a minute. Let's, let's look at this. When we're talking about original sin, what's the proper response? It's not just bowing your head. It's baptism. It's water. And what do you use water to clean up from? Dirt and grime and scum and oil. I mean, to, to, sin is not just something you think about. It's something you turn to God and, and, and ask for it to be washed away as with water. There, there's a very physical aspect to that. Sin is not merely a spiritual problem. It has physical dimensions as well. We see this in when Jesus is baptized. He is immersed in water, and then as he comes out of the water, uh, the, the heavens are, depending on which gospel you're reading, the heavens are rent open, a voice speaks, a dove comes down, something like a dove. There is a, a connection between the physical and the spiritual reality there. One of the most sort of extreme examples of this connection between the physical and the spiritual is this ancient practice that's called the baptism of blood. That sounds very serious, doesn't it? It sounds like a bad novel name or something like that. This is actual, this is uh, in the first centuries of the church, what the baptism of blood was. If you had decided to follow Jesus and you had, you'd become a catechumen, the, the term for someone who is studying before being baptized, and, and you were martyred for the faith before you were baptized, you are understood to have been baptized by your own blood. Isn't that a wonderfully uplifting mental image? Yeah, but that, that's the, you know, and that's not how we think about things today, is it? it when, we, when someone dies and if they haven't been baptized, we just say, ah, you know, they've, uh, they, they believed in Jesus. I mean, we don't really focus on the body as, as, as where salvation happens as much as with the Spirit. But the early church, they held that together. If you died for the faith, you were baptized because they, they wanted to know that the body was marked as much as the Spirit. But we just don't think about things like that today. We, we, have you ever heard someone use the phrase, my body failed me? You ever heard that phrase? I, I hear it on occasion. It, we, our approach, we don't integrate body and spirit as they once did, uh, early Christians did. We tend to disassociate. And, and so I hear people say, my body failed me. 
And it's like my car didn't start, or my toaster doesn't work, or my hard drive crashed. It's like the real me is up here that you can't see, and this just happens to be what I'm driving today. And uh, that the body is something we own, something we possess. But the early Christians remind us that, uh, the Christian faith reminds us that we are fully spirit, fully body in a way that cannot be detached from each other. You can't say, we can't say as Christians, my body failed me. What we can say is, I have failed me, but it's not like it's my body, like I just need to go trade it in. What we happen with, what we do with our body, what we do with our spirit are, are intrinsically connected. We are fully spirit and fully body in a way that cannot be detached from each other. And so what happens in our our body and what happens in our spirit are always connected. One way to sort of conceive of this, and kind of a happy way to think of in this, it's not quite as cold today, but it's not exactly warm. I'd like you to uh, imagine being on the beach, right? Who here has sw swum in the ocean? Okay, so many of you have had this experience. Imagine you're on the beach, and you're going to go swimming in the water. You go swim, and you're enjoying, the, you're enjoying the waves, and then you start to come up out of the water. What do you notice as you're coming out of the water that you didn't notice before? The wind, right? As you come up out of the water, when you're just sopping wet, you notice the wind far more than you did when you were getting in the water. Does that mean the wind wasn't there? There's always wind at the beach, right? The, um, the water and the land uh, absorb and dissipate heat at different rates, and so there's always wind moving between them, because wind is air moving between areas of different temperatures. So there's always a wind blowing at the beach. But do you notice it? All right, you come out of the water and you notice because you're sopping wet. I think that's a helpful way to think about baptism. The wind is always blowing. In Greek and in Hebrew, the word for spirit and the word for wind are the same. Ruach in Hebrew, pneuma in Greek. So, but they're the same words. And so in Genesis 1.1, when it talks about the, the spirit moving over the surface of the deep, it also says the wind moving over the surface of the deep. It's the same, wind, same word, same idea. And so the question is not, is the wind blowing? The wind has been blowing since the beginning of creation. The spirit has been moving since the beginning of all that ever has been and ever will be. The question is not, is it moving? The question is, do you feel it? Do you experience? Do you know? Do you understand that it's going on around you? And so, part of baptism, an essential part of baptism, is getting your body wet so you can feel the wind, so you can observe and see what the Spirit is moving, uh, how it's moving around you. And once you have gotten wet, you come out of that water, you feel the wind, you're more likely to notice the wind when you go on the beach the next time, aren't you? It, it, there's something, another aspect of how the wind works is uh, if you go to the beach, have you all ever heard of what's called salt pruning? Salt pruning is this idea, or it's not an idea, it actually happens. As the wind blows across the water, it picks up granules of salt, and this salty, moist air comes and hits all the vegetation. And what, do you, what happens if you hit vegetation with salt water? It's not good for the plant, right? It starts to get pruned down. And so, you don't, you've never seen this before, but next time you go to the beach, you will notice this. The closer you get to the beach, the smaller the plants get. Right? It's called salt pruning. It's the action of the wind on the world around you. You don't notice it till you notice the wind, but now, but now that you've seen how the wind is in, impacting the world, I can't go to the beach without noticing how the plants shrink. I can tell how close I am to the beach by how much the, the plants have shrunk. It, it's the same thing with noticing the Holy Spirit after baptism. Once you are paying attention, you will notice it every time. You might, in ways that you might, it, it's not that the Holy Spirit wasn't acting before, it's that now that you're starting to pay attention, you can't not notice it. I think this is part, maybe one way to help understand uh, one of the more interesting passages in, in Acts, Acts 19, when Paul comes across 12 disciples, it's in Ephesus, and he asks them, have you been, have you received the Holy Spirit? Do you know what the Holy Spirit is doing? And they say, Huh? 
And he asks them, have you been baptized? And they say, yes, we've been baptized with the baptism of John, the baptism of repentance. And he says, there's more going on here than just repentance, folks. You need to be baptized to notice the movement of the Holy Spirit. And, and that's what happens. They are baptized and the Spirit comes upon them and they begin to speak in tongues. And I'm not touching speaking in tongues today. I believe it happens, but let's just take that whole topic and say another time. But the spirit, the spirit moves, and now that they were paying attention, it's not that the spirit wasn't. It's not that the spirit wasn't moving before, but now they know what they're looking for. Now, I must confess that if you are looking for a saint of the church to help you understand the coming of and goings of the spirit intimately, I may not be your man. I find the movings of the Spirit to be uh, challenging to pin down. And, and I find this to be true in the Gospels as well. If you read the Gospels, when, when Jesus comes up out of the water, what happens? The spirit, something happens with the Spirit. Spirit moves. And, and depending which Gospel you read, something like a dove descends. Or the heavens are rent open and a voice says to the entire crowd, this is my son to, with whom I am well pleased. Or the, the voice says just to Jesus, this is my son to, for, with whom I am well pleased. Which one's right? Well, they're all right. One, experienced this, one, one of the authors of the Gospels experienced that moment as this sort of violent thing with, with the heavens rent open. One experienced much more peaceful with the dove coming down. One experiences it and describes it as a much more intimate experience. The way the Spirit moves, you know, I can't pin it down. I, I can't. I find that the, our spiritual lives to be a bit squirrely. I just can't quite get my hands around them all, uh, very often. I, I was uh, reading an account of another pastor, Andy, uh, pa another Andy, his pastor down in Springfield, Missouri. And the way he tells of his call to ministry, he was singing in the choir, watching someone be baptized. And as he was watching this child be baptized, he thought, I wish I could be part of that. That would be awesome to be part of that. And he he heard a voice clear as day. You can be. Okay. And so he went off to seminary, and now he is an amazing, amazing pastor. That's how he, he heard the Spirit move in his life. And that's beautiful and wonderful. I, I've never had a voice tell me anything. For me, it's far more about having peace and calm and joy and assurance and being able to respond to things in a way that, that is Christ-like. I don't have, the, you know... Trying to pin down how the Spirit works. If you got it figured out, let me know. But until you got it figured out, here's what I can tell you. How you move your bodies impacts how you experience the Spirit. Right? Your body and your spirit are one. They are connected. And so what we do with our bodies changes and impacts how we understand, how we experience the Spirit of God. We say this in how we pray, right? We, how we pray matters. Right? If, if we are, what we are tempted to think when we pray is we just kind of close our eyes and go, hmm. Right? I came across a poem this week by Coleridge. I have no reason, I have no clue why it came up, but I just want to share it with you. Don't be impressed. I haven't gone to reading poetry every day. But this poem about, about prayer, uh, I came across this. He, he writes, Air on my bed, my limbs I lay, it hath not been my use to pray with moving lips or bended knees, but silently, by slow degrees. My spirit I to love compose, in humble trust my eyelid, mine eyelids close, with reverential resignation, no wish conceived, no thought expressed, only a sense of supplication. A sense o'er all my soul impressed that I am weak yet not unblessed, since in me, round me, everywhere, eternal strength and wisdom are. You know, that's our, our temptation, right? To, to close our eyes and, and not to have any thought, but just to sit there and, and allow God to be. And you know what happens if I do that? I either fall asleep or I start thinking about dinner. Right? That, that, that's... that's <laughs> Maybe, maybe y'all practice meditation. Maybe you have, you have practices of intentional silence that are wonderful. And if you do, I am in awe of you. But let me tell you the reality of prayer is that what you do with your body shapes what your mind, what your spirit does. And so for some, if you need to bow your heads, clasp your hands, and kneel to pray then do it. First century, the first couple centuries, they prayed with arms open and, and, and head up. 
you're speaking to God with hands open to receive what God would offer, right? If that's what, how you need to pray, that's how you need to pray. Myself, I pray with the same pen, in the same book, in the same place, in the same chair, at the same time in the morning, so that my body, when I sit down to do that, that's the only thing I, I, I'm doing right then and there. It, it help, what I do with my body helps me focus so that dinner can wait and, and, I, and I'll stay awake because that's my, my two distractions. But, but it, what I do with my body shapes how I'm able to experience the Spirit moving around me. All right? <clears throat> I cannot tell you how to feel God's presence in prayer, but I can tell you that if you attend to your body, that's part of it. I cannot tell you how to control your spirit, but I can tell you that if you control your body, that is part of it. And so the best I can tell you today is to stay wet. If in baptism we get wet and we are become more uh, observant to the Spirit moving in and around us, that's the best I can tell you today. Stay wet. Don't just say, I'm a sinner. Seek baptism. Don't just think about praying. Bow your head. Don't think about forgiving. Go shake hands. Don't contemplate the needies. Go volunteer at the food pantry next Thursday. Uh, don't think about God. Open the Bible and listen to God. All right. The most important moment in the life of John Wesley was this moment where he had the, his heart strangely warmed. It's a story he tells many times. Where he is, he has this moment where he has this calm assurance that Jesus died for him, that he is loved, that he is forgiven. It's the moment his whole life turns on. And it doesn't happen when he's lying in bed just going, hmm. It happens when he has got his butt out of bed and he is going to a church meeting. He has offered this time to God, and on the way, the Spirit moves and God shows up. God was there, he was paying attention. Right. What you do with your bodies matters. Live wet and pay attention to how the Spirit is moving around you today. Amen.